Yeah, two for. Do you want to take both repeats? First. Well, we've got two repeats. You want to take one or two? No. We'll take both? All right, all right. Let's run this out. Five minutes. Uh, there. 25 is just a repeat, right? Yeah, and there's the one before one. that also. No. At the beginning. 24 is Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And oh, one at the end.
All rise.
Please be seated. Good afternoon to our graduates, their families and friends, my colleagues on the faculty and staff, and honored guests. Welcome to the 2023 commencement of the School of Law. This afternoon, we will award three sets of degrees, the Juris Doctor degree, the LLM or Masters of Laws degree, and the JM or Juris Masters. We award the Juris Doctor degree to 121 students. Two of our JD students will receive a joint Masters in Business Administration. One of our JD students will receive a joint master's in social work. Nine of our JD students will receive the LLM in taxation or business transactions. 10 other students will receive the LLM in taxation or business transactions. One student will receive the Juris Master's degree. And 11 students will receive the Order of Samaritan Award for pro bono legal work and service to the community. This is the most festive occasion in the life of any academic institution. It's a celebration of you, our students, who are the reason that we on the faculty and in administration do what we do. It's a celebration of your achievement in reaching a singular milestone, and it's a celebration of things to come. If it's a time for celebration, it's also a time for reflection. Uh, it's a day to reflect especially on the many things that brought you to this moment. Although the achievement we celebrate today belongs to each of you as individuals. And no, no one can take that away from you. It's also undeniably the product of larger events, forces, currents, product also of people who help to elevate you. They're your families, your friends, your teachers, and one another. Elevation often comes from support, but it also comes from adversity, from what you learn about yourself, about the world as you meet adversity, from the skills you acquire to navigate rough waters, from the sense of purpose you can cultivate in meeting life's challenges. Speaking of challenges, you are the only class in the modern history of the law school to have spent all three of your years of study in the midst of a global pandemic. This has been both an individual and a collective challenge. But the manner in which you have met it will mark you and your generation. And despite the struggles, you persevered, and in doing so, you can draw strength and take pride. Now please rise for the national anthem to be sung by a member of the graduating class, Angel Sims. say can you see by the dawn's early light was so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag 
You may be seated. Thank you, Angel. Let me recognize also the string quartet who were playing to my uh, right for their music during the processional. It's very nice. It's customary for the outgoing president of the Student Bar Association to share remarks. Blaze Naiman has served in that office this past year, and as you may notice, he will not be crossing the graduation stage today. That is because he's obtaining a dual degree, JD and an MBA, that requires additional coursework beyond the usual coursework for the JD. Uh, I am confident that he will continue to tackle his final courses with the same gusto and ability that has marked his career so far in the law school. Blaze, will you please offer reflections on behalf of the SBA? Thank you, Dean Brennan, for clearing that up for me. You know, I've had to tell a lot of people that I didn't fail any classes. I've actually had to keep staying here for actual classes, but uh, I didn't fail enough for them to make me stay another year, so. Um, you know, I took a walk around the law school last week, and for no particular reason, really. I wasn't rushing to any classes or trying to make a meeting. Instead, I was sort of just reminiscing on the past several years here. And as if a replay reel was rolling through my head, I started imagining all the friendly faces and the memories in my favorite parts of the school. You know, it's hard to believe that we've been together here for three years. And those three years have gone by fast. And after all this time of rushing and counting down the days to get the degree, sometimes it's hard to just stop and enjoy yourself. But in the last few days, I've noticed that the time has kind of slowed down. And it finally hit me on this walk that I'm really gonna miss these people. So as I'm walking around the school daydreaming, I'll tell you what I dreamt of. I saw Jaleel Washington sitting in the foyer outside the cafe. He had a big smile on his face and he asked me how my day was going, just like he does every single time that he sees me. And he made me feel like I was the only person in the room. Then I walked through the long halls at the front of the building with the beautiful sunlight that lights up the school. And I saw John Crop taking advantage of that sunlight in his tank top tanning in the courtyard. <laughs> On my walk, I was greeted by Caroline Barge and Dean Head and Professor McMichael and all the other great faculty and staff members that make going to school here more enjoyable. And I keep walking until I arrive at the infamous crimson red carpet in the library. And I see Sarah Atkinson and her whole squad of library dwellers. And I see the king of the library, Mr. Leon, just two more great examples of people who, even on your worst days at the school, if you're lucky enough to run into them, they just make you feel like it's all worth it. But then I got anxious because something about being in that library this late into the year really just freaks me out. So I left. But as I left, I, was, I felt this large shake in the school, almost like an earthquake, enough to wake me up from my daydream. And I turned to my left, and there it is. It's no earthquake. It's just John Dawson after his fourth cup of coffee and a bang energy drink, just sitting down, anxiously shaking that leg and telling everybody how stressed out he is because it's April 25th and he hadn't started outlining. And I was reminded how, no matter how worried I am about the future, I find comfort knowing John Dawson is a little more nervous than me. And then I finally walked into room 187, 188, where it all began. I hadn't been there in a while, Truthfully, I haven't spent any meaningful time in there since I was a 1L, and I started thinking, wow, a lot has changed in three years. We started out here three years ago as young, timid kids who were starting law school at truly one of the most tumultuous times in modern history, separated by face masks and plexiglass dividers, scared and hardly knowing anyone's names. And now look at us, dressed in caps and gowns, united, and friends. And some of us are crying, and I've seen a lot of tears in the law school, but this time we aren't crying because we're scared. I see tears of joy because of our individual achievements, our collective achievements, 
and most importantly, the relationships that we've made along the way. You know, I can't really say that I'm gonna miss the cold calls or the late nights in the library or the stresses of landing a job in OCIs, but I really will miss the people that I did it all with. Bama Law is a wonderful, wonderful place, and it's because of the people that belong here. Thank you all for making these three years worthwhile. I will miss you all dearly. I wish you all the best of luck in your careers and in your lives, and I cannot wait to see the amazing people that you will become. Thanks. Thank you, Blaze, and thank you for your service. The valedictory address is a tradition at Alabama Law. It's customary that the address be given by the student who occupies the highest rank in the graduating class. For the class of 2023, there are two students who at the end of five semesters of study had grade point averages above a 4.0. Those outstanding students are Bill Waite and Catherine Oglesby. Bill came to the law school from Des Moines, Iowa. He served as a senior editor of the Alabama Law Review and as a member of and greater for the Alabama Law Moot Court Board. Served also as brief writer for the Jessup International Law Moot Court Competition Team. He is a registered patent agent and after graduation he will join the firm of Doherty and Manning in Greenville, South Carolina as an associate. Catherine, or Kat, is from Little Rock, Arkansas. She served as articles editor on the Alabama Law Review and her article, Moot Election Disputes, I have to find out what that's all about, is now published in the current volume of the Law Review. She will begin her career as a business associate at Norton Rose Fulbright in Dallas, Texas. Following the law school's standing procedure for breaking painfully close ties in calculating GPA, Kat Oglesby has been designated valedictorian for the class of 2023. Kat, would you please come forward? Thank you, Dean Brandon, uh, for that kind introduction. Professors, faculty, staff, friends, family, and loved ones, thank you for being here today. And fellow graduates, I am so happy to see each and every one of you here. Today has felt like such a long time coming, so long that when I think back to life before we started here at Alabama Law, that time of my life almost seems foreign that life before law school just feels like a different lifetime ago. And it feels ironic, or maybe even full circle, when I say that about this whole life before law school, because I remember a conversation I had before law school with someone close to me who had been to law school and talked to me about it and their outlook on it. And he said, now Kat, people talk about how there's life before law school and there's life after law school. And then he paused for a second before he told me about what happens to life during law school. <laughs> but I'll leave that for each of your imaginations. Um, reflecting on that saying, though, about life before and life after law school, it made me wonder, why is law school something of a demarcation in our lives? Why is it one of those before and after points? And I do think that some things have remained the same for us before law school to now. Take our personalities, for example. Some of us were probably the argumentative ones at the dinner table, even before law school, and we still are. But on the other hand, I think sometimes we take for granted both the learning and the growing that we've done these last three years. For starters, we survived the first year, where, as the old saying, the old saying goes, they scared us to death. And that was even when a Zoom screen or plexiglass and mask were what separated us from our 1L professors. 
That year, though, it was more reading than we'd ever done. It forced us to be more disciplined than we ever thought we could be. We learned to question the way we thought about things, to question almost everything, it felt like at times, and to accept nothing at face value. And from that year on, though, we learned to replace the confusion and fear that I know we all felt those first few weeks of law school with confidence and mental acuity. And going forward, our last two years, we took those tools from 1L, not just to other classes, but also to our legal journals, scholarship, our summer jobs, to our externships, to clinics, and to help others, and so much more. But in all, the last two years and nine months, Yes, they've been exhausting and all-consuming and even frustrating at times. But they've also been exciting and exhilarating and awe-inspiring. Law school may have broken each of us down at least, at least a time or two. But in doing so, it rebuilt us into more thoughtful and more intellectually critical persons. At its core, our time here at Alabama Law has been about teaching us a different way to think. And once we experienced that different way of thinking, it was impossible for us to ever go back to the way we were before. We now look at everything in the world through a more critical, a more analytical prism. It's in our nature to do just that. Our time here at Alabama Law, though, is the difference between who we were and who we are today. And this brings us to today, where it's important for me to make the following acknowledgments. So first, to professors, faculty, and staff behind me. <laughs> Thank you for providing us with a sound and quality legal education. I mean it when I say that it has been a privilege to attend law school, and to attend this law school in particular, and to learn from you and to have you as a resource. So thank you. And to our family, our friends, and our loved ones, thank you for your unwavering support and love. We would not be here today if it was not for you. And for me personally, thank you also for helping to raise and shape and inspire my fellow graduates. Their intellect, tenacity, friendship, acceptance, and so much more has played such an important role in my personal law school experience. And to that, and, for, and to you, I'm very grateful. And finally, to my fellow graduates, words don't do justice for what you've done for me in my law school experience, and probably for the rest of you for each other. But I will say this, thank you for the community here at Alabama Law that each of you contributed to building for our class. Thank you for your encouragement, your spirit, your friendship, both on a personal and a professional level, and for making these three years challenging and fun and with regret in all the same ways. I stand here today just as awestruck by each of you as I did on our first day of orientation in rooms 187 and 188, when Dean Brandon read off all those amazing accomplishments about our class from each of our lives before law school. And today, I have no doubt that each of you will continue to do just that as we advance in our practice and in our life after law school. But for now, for today, I am so proud of us. I hope each of you are too. We did it. Congratulations, y'all. Thank you, Kat, and congratulations. Uh, before we move to the next part of the program, I want to recognize some special members of the platform party who are seated on the stage. First are members of this year's hooding team. They are members of the faculty who have been chosen by the class of 2023 to participate in this year's ceremony. Their names are listed in the program, but I should recite them for you here. Shahar Dilberry, Heather Elliott, Brian Fair, Ben McMichael. And I should note that Dean Anita K. Head was also chosen but could not be here today with regret. Also joining us today is Judge John H. England, Jr., class of 1974 retired from the circuit court bench after having served as a justice on the Alabama Supreme Court. He is an emeritus member of the Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama System 
and I should note, uh, not too long ago, winner of the Samuel Pipes Award as outstanding alumnus of the School of Law. Finally, also joining us on stage uh, is Judge L. Scott Kugler, class of 1984, Chief Judge for the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Alabama and long-standing teacher of and mentor for countless numbers of students of Alabama law. And he has, I think, a special interest in today's graduating class. To the Hooders, congratulations and thanks. And to Judges England and Kugler, we are honored to have you here. Uh, it's now a pleasure and a distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Mike House. Mike grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and after taking his uh, undergraduate degree from Auburn University, he enrolled at the School of Law and graduated here in 1971. Since then, he has become one of the most talented lawyers in the nation. He's an astute analyst, a creative tactician, superb strategist. And how he got there is a combination of determination, hard work, raw ability, and if I may say so, an excellent legal education. He commenced his career as Chief of Staff to Howell Heflin, who was then Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court. In his role as Chief of Staff, he took on responsibility for a massively ambitious legislative agenda that included drafting and the eventual ratification of the judicial article of the Constitution of the State of Alabama in 1973. Fifty years out, this amendment stands as one of the most significant and commendable structural changes to the Alabama Constitution in the last century, unifying the state's judiciary and bringing it into the modern age. Be thankful that you study uh, uh, the judiciary and civil procedure of the state of Alabama today instead of 50 years ago. In recognition of his work on the judicial article, he became the youngest person ever to receive the award of merit from the Alabama State Bar. During his time with the Alabama Supreme Court and after that, uh, as a practicing lawyer in Montgomery, he served as president of the Alabama Young Lawyers. Mike then moved to Washington, D.C., where his career, it's safe to say, flourished. He served as a legislative clerk to the Senate Banking Committee and as a legislative assistant to Congressman James M. Collins of Texas. Now, when his former boss, then Chief Justice Howell Heflin ran for one of Alabama's seats on the United States Senate. Mike managed a successful campaign and joined Senator Heflin again as Chief of Staff, this time in the Senate, a position that Mike held for eight years. And at the time, he was the youngest Chief of Staff in the Senate. After a long, impressive career in public service, he founded and chaired the legislative section of the D.C. law firm Shaw Pittman. Then he took on a similar role for 28 years with the international firm Hogan Lovells. In 2020, he left Hogan to establish his own consulting firm, Oak Grove Strategies. His roster of professional recognitions is extensive, I'll mention just three here. He is listed in Band 1 of Chambers USA in Governmental Relations, where he is recognized as one of the top three legislative lawyers in Washington. For more than a decade, he's been listed as one of the best lawyers of America, and for more than a decade, he's been listed as a Washington, D.C. super lawyer. His Impressive as his achievements and, uh, and recognitions have been, his record of service is exemplary. Honorary trustee for the Shakespeare Theater in Washington, D.C. Chair, closer to home, chair 
of the advisory board for the Blackburn Institute at the University of Alabama. It's been a labor of love for both Mike and his wife, Gina, who is also here today. Chair of the Alumni Society for the University of Alabama School of Law, President of the Board of Governors of the Law School Foundation. His leadership has also been extraordinary. I'll highlight only three examples. As an alumni member and leader of the Law School's Strategic Planning Committee from 2019 to 2021, he has helped to set us on a path to reach even higher for student success, for the growth and enrichment of faculty, and improvement of facilities, all while advancing diversity and inclusion and not losing sight of our unique mission within the state of Alabama. Second, he serves as campaign manager for our cabinet member of the university's Rising Tide Capital Campaign, which is a $1.5 billion campaign. Now, the law school's goal is $30 million, and that support is going to help us achieve great things as we embark on the next 150 years of our history. Third, Mike was integral to the founding and flourishing of our externship program in Washington, D.C. He's had a hand in every aspect of the program and has made it one of the best such programs of any law school in the country. I know firsthand the extent of Mike's investment in and commitment to the School of Law. He's been a splendid partner and an inspiration. So please join me in, welcome, in welcoming our keynote speaker, Mike House. <clears throat> Dean Brandon, I uh, thank you for that kind introduction. My parents would have loved it, and my classmates would not have believed it. <laughs> Dean, this is your final graduation ceremony. I think there's been eight, um, and it's been a pleasure working with you over these years. Uh, and I can attest to your commitment to the law school and your commitment to the legal profession. And I value it deeply, and I am sure that everybody here feels the same way. When I prepared these remarks, it forced me to think back over my career. And as the uh, dean kind of listed, it's, it's been a kind of a long and winding one. Um, but it's also been a long and fulfilling one, for the most part. It hasn't been without its challenges, and challenges bring opportunities. I thought about my teaching of the DC extern class, and I see some of you here today and what I learned from the students, and I learned a lot. I'm grateful to the law school for preparing me for my journey and for giving me the opportunity to teach and learn from so many outstanding students. So today I'm going to try to impart on you, the graduating class of 2023, some of the knowledge and wisdom that I picked up over my long years journey. I also plan to combine that with the knowledge of a 79-year-old rock star, a 100-year-old Secretary of State, an 86-year-old civil rights activist and poet laureate, and a 27,000-year-old wizard. But let me first offer my congratulations. Congratulations to you, the graduating class of 2023, or the COVID class, as you've been called. You were brave souls in September of 2020. You walked into the unknown, an uncharted territory. No one knew where the pandemic was going to end, 
but you persevered. And here you are today in your cap and gown, surrounded by your loved ones, getting your diploma. In class, that took hard work and a heck of a lot of dedication. As importantly, congratulations to the families that are all here today. I know you are proud, and you should be. And I am thankful today to be allowed to be here to share this with you, and it is both an honor and a privilege. A famous British philosopher and poet, Mick Jagger, once sang, you can't always get what you want, but sometimes, my friend, you get what you need. Many of you, like me, came to law school with a certain set of expectations. Some of them were fulfilled and others were not. But the fundamental question is, did you get what you needed? There are three major achievements you need to begin your career. You need to graduate, you need to pass the bar, and you definitely need to get a job. I see the parents are all agreeing with that one. <laughs> Today you will graduate, and soon you will pass the bar, primarily because you attended an outstanding institution with a stellar faculty. They are proud of you, and I am sure you are grateful for them. The third major achievement happens the day you walk into your first job. Fortunately, because of your hard work, you should be getting a job without a problem. But it could have been in 2009, and I saw that. That was the year after 2008. But currently, the legal market is strong, and the global legal market is approaching $1 trillion. You heard me. One trillion dollars. Law schools still emphasize practicing at law firms, as they probably should, since 60 percent of you will actually go to a law firm at some point in your career. That's a far cry from the 85 percent that did that when I graduated. But there, there are just so many other opportunities today. Corporations, accounting firms, consulting firms, state and national government, federal agencies, and nonprofit organizations, just to name a few. And I encourage you to be open to those options. The average lawyer changes jobs seven times in their career. Law firms are good, but your legal training is a solid foundation for your success in many fields, so take advantage of it. When I graduated from law school, there were only two of us that went to Washington, D.C. The rest of our class thought we were crazy. There were only two women in our class and no black students. Currently, over 50 percent of the class are women. Our freshman class is the most diverse in the school's history. And Washington, D.C. is a primary place to go for our graduates that are going out of state. As our law school changed, so is the practice of law. The transformation of law firms was gradual until about 2008, and then it took off, and it has accelerated during the pandemic. Many people think that over the next 20 years, the practice of law will change more than it has in the past 200. What is driving that change? Technology, and especially artificial intelligence or AI. And you will hear a lot about that already. You've heard a lot about it already. AI is coming at a pace that nobody fully appreciates. And in the beginning, what it will do, it will cause redeployment rather than unemployment among lawyers. But in the long term, it will be a major disruptor of the legal profession. Yet, unlike me and others of my generation, 
you grew up with technology. It's kind of second nature to you. And therefore, you have the ability to use it as a tool rather than having it replaced you. So a year from now, you would have gotten what you needed. Graduation, you passed the bar, you got your first job. But what about the next four years? I know that's the last thing in the world you're thinking about right now. I mean, I get that. <laughs> but the le next 40 years, and you're going to be dealing with an ever-changing profession, and it's going to be rapidly changing. Again, I thought about my own journey. Was there something I learned in law school that was neither evident or fully appreciated at the time? One thing that was vital to my career and withstood the test of time. The ability to think. Now you may say, if we didn't have that ability, we wouldn't have gotten in law school. And we certainly wouldn't be here today. And I agree with that. And that is true. However, a legal education fosters and hones your ability to think analytically and strategically. That skill will give you the ability to compete no matter what path you take in your career. It is a difference between a good career or a great career. In my profession, what I do, we call that the difference between playing checkers and playing chess. And if you're going to be successful, you're going to have to play chess in your career. Now, if you're good at thinking analytically and strategically, it will greatly help you perform one of the most vital and least discussed skill you will use in your career. And that is the ability to make the ask. The ability to make the ask. That skill is crucial professionally to your clients and personally to you and your family. You will use it often, whether it's a client, a jury, judge, board of directors, a boss, for me, a member of Congress. Some ask are more important than others. Some are life-changing. The most successful ask is the one where you are prepared and you have thought through it and set it up strategically. Now, I would say that one of the most delicate asks is the one you make of your partner and spouse. Recently, I had to get a memo out to a client. It was late at night. I knew if I didn't finish it that the next day I wouldn't be able to take my wife, Gina, to the cherry blossoms, to see the cherry blossoms. And in D.C., that's one of our annual rituals that we do. It was 11.45. My computer went down, and I had no earthly idea how to fix it. And that's probably normal for me, because I'm definitely technically challenged. That's probably an understatement. Um, so the ask went like this. Hey, Gina, I hit the wrong button on my computer, and it isn't working, and I am in deep trouble, and I'm not going to be able to get this memo out tonight. What do we need to do about it? Gina replies, we? We? Do you have a mouse in your pocket? She, um, but she knew it was an important one. And so she walked over, she hit two buttons, she clicked the mouse, it started working again. She smiled and said, I'm going to bed, you need to finish your memo. And off she went. Now my reason for telling you this is that of all the places that you've got to think strategically, first and foremost, it's in the home. It'll save you a lot of trouble down the road, trust me. There is another trait important to your career. It is the ability to engender trust in both your 
personal and professional life. George Shultz was one of the truly great public servants in our recent history. He was Secretary of Labor, he was Secretary of the Treasury, he was Secretary of State. He served under multiple presidents, his ex and his extraordinary career was centered on diplomacy and negotiations. Just days before he turned 100 years old, and two months before he died, he wrote an article for the Washington Post on trust. He stated that when trust was in the room, whatever the room might be, be it the family room, the school room, the locker room, the board room, or the government room, good things happened. When trust wasn't in the room, good things did not happen. Everything else is merely details. I would say that trust is a missing ingredient in our society today. It is also missing in many of our institutions, our organizations, and our governing bodies, especially Congress. I see it in Congress, and you can see it in the debate over the debt limit that's going on right now. Not one of these entities can function effectively without trust, but neither can you. So you must strive to be trustworthy in your career as well as your personal life. Now, I presume that each of you possess the ability to be proficient in legal matters or you wouldn't be here today. That along with the ability to think analytically and strategically as well as the ability to engender trust are three of the major cor cornerstones of your reputation. Your reputation is one of your most important assets. It takes years to build, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes consistency. Yet it can be destroyed in an instant. And once it is tarnished, it is very difficult to rebuild. So you have to value it and you have to protect it at all costs. Your reputation is paramount to your success. But your reputation is also built upon the impressions others have of you. And one key component of that is how you treat others. The late Maya Angelou, the famous author, poet, and civil rights activist said it best. People will not remember what you said. People will not remember what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. These words are words to live by, aspects of your personal and professional life. Amen to that. Finally, there's a well-known Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. This is the world that we live in, and this is the world that you're going to live in, you're going to practice in, and you're going to have your career in. I call it a world of permanent crisis. It means there's a new crisis every day. The 24-hour news cycle and social media not only thrive on it, but they demand it, and at times they even fabricate it. Recent polling shows that a majority of this country is looking for a sense of stability, a sense of calmness, and just a time to catch our collective breath. And I think everybody here, not only you, but your parents and other people here know exactly what I'm talking about. In The Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit, Frodo, expresses that feeling to the 27,000-year-old wizard Gandalf. Now, I bet some of you have been wondering when I was going to bring the wizard up. Frodo said, I wish it need not have happened in my time. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what we do in the time that is given us. Today you begin your journey, class of 2023. Congratulations again. 
We expect a lot out of you. You're a tough crowd. You're good, and you went through a lot. Many, many years from now, your career like mine will come to an end. And I'm sure yours would have been challenging, and I'm sure yours would have been very successful. And when it does end, you want to look back and you want to say, I did my best for my family. I did my best for my community and my country. I did my best for my profession. And I did the best for myself in the time that was given me. Thank you, good luck, and God bless. Thank you, Mike. We shall now confer the Juris Doctor degree upon this, the distinguished class of 2023, immediately following. We'll also confer the Master of Laws degree and the Juris Master's degree. Would the candidates for the Juris Doctor degree please stand? By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama System and as recommended and approved by the Alabama Law Faculty, I confer upon each of you the Juris Doctor degree with all of its rights, responsibilities, privileges, and duties. Tassels left. Congratulations. Please be seated. Would the candidates for the Master of Laws degree please stand? By virtue of the authority, <laughs> It doesn't work if you're not standing. <laughs> it's magic. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama System, and as recommended and approved by the Alabama Law Faculty, I confer upon each of you the Master of Laws degree with all of its rights, responsibilities, privileges and duties, and if your tassels are to the right, you may move them to the left. Congratulations. <laughs> you may be uh, would the candidate for the Juris Master degree please stand? If he is here, she. <laughs> By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the University of Alabama System and as recommended and approved by the Alabama Law Faculty, I confer upon you the Juris Master's degree with all of its rights, responsibilities, privileges, and duties. Congratulations. Marshals, please begin the procession.
Catherine Thomas Oglesby, who will also be receiving the Harrison Award. Marjorie Millen Head, who will also be receiving the Harrison Award. Louisa Davenport Chafee Weiss, who will also be receiving the Harrison Award. Andrew Bascom Tucker, who will also be receiving the Harrison Award. Veer Govin R. Cagle, who will also be receiving the Harrison Award. Julie Christine Newton, who will also be receiving Order of Samaritan and the Public Interest Certificate. <clears throat> Caleb Glendon Howard, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan. Roxana Lopez Ramos, who will also be receiving the Order of Samaritan and Public Interest Certificate. <laughs> Diana J. Snellgrove, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan and the Public Interest Certificate. <clears throat> Megan Ruth McElroy, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan and the Public Interest Certificate. Alyssa C. McGee, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan. <clears throat> Caitlin Marie Castle, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan. Lucy Elizabeth Derricks, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan. <clears throat> Charles Louis Steinmetz, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan. Jonathan Andrew Kropp, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan. <clears throat> Jeremy D. Martin, who will also be receiving the Order of the Samaritan. Angel Maria Sims. <clears throat> B. 
Bailey Andrew Bowling. Danielle Marie Hunt. Cameron L. Dobbs. Margaret Garrett Canary, who will also be receiving the Certificate in International and Comparative Law. Sarah Mashburn Atkinson. Julianne Bethany Lynn. Allison Kugler Vara. Rebecca Taylor Steen. Caroline Price Matthews. Emily Glass Sims. Natalie Denson Henry. Ashton A. Hayes. Callie Moss Shearer. Meredith Ray Moore. <laughs> Elizabeth Ann Brown. Taylor Rain Holt. Kyra D. Perkins. Rain Lachey Cook. <laughs> J. 
Jaleel D. Washington, who will also be receiving the Public Interest Certificate. Renisha Leanne Braxton. <laughs> Carly Alexis Smith. Amani Desamaria Moore. Crystal Nicole Armstrong. Constanza Isabella Mays. Okay, okay. Uh, Madison Taylor Bentley. Rebecca J. Bisson. Grover Cleveland Robinson the Fifth. Tamor Arshad. Samantha Elisa Ryerson. Cole Sebastian Dempsey. Woo! Boston James Topping. Joseph Gladstone Burns the Fourth. <laughs> Layla Mercedes Beam Nunez.
Nathaniel Fisk Ohl. Harrison Franklin Smith. Fernanda Contreras. Taylor Nicole Eckenrod. Laura Catherine Pack, who will also be receiving the Certificate in Governmental Affairs. <laughs> Megan Nicole McNabb, who will be receiving both the JD and the LLM in taxation. Felipe Curiel. <laughs> William Hall Bridges. William Bennett Davis Terry. <laughs> Cassidy Page Connell, who will also be receiving the Public Interest Certificate. Caroline Keener Baldwin, who will be receiving both the JD and the LLM in taxation. <laughs> Brenna Renee Johnson. Jillian Sage Vice. <laughs> Ashley Rebecca West. Madeline D. Turner. <laughs> Caroline Key Lambert. Catherine Alexandra Hill, who will also be receiving the Public Interest Certificate. <laughs> Bailey Catherine Cormier, who will be receiving both the JD and the LLM in taxation. Drew Smith Pearson. <laughs> T. 
Tanner A. Love. Hunter Sims. <laughs> Jillian Miller Purdue. Hunter Jackson, who will be receiving both the JD and the LLM in taxation. Bradley A. Deem. Christopher Mark O'Connor. Robert Woodrow Williams. Luke Alton Stevenson. <laughs> Bart Harrison Adams, Jr. Philip H. Boyd III. <laughs> James Witt Watts. Walter Timothy Derryberry. <laughs> Leslie Elena Hudson. Alexandra McKay Van Blericum. <laughs> Cole Christopher Adams. Mackenzie Nicole Merrifield, who will also be receiving the public interest certificate. <laughs> Jack Warren Emerson.
Rachel Marie Sims. Douglas C. Martinson III. Cameron Nicol Nicholas Regneri. Ralph Bernard Luigi Marcaselli. <laughs> Garrett Francis Lucy. Samuel Arthur Cochran. John D. Dawson. Brandon Berenger III, who will be receiving both the JD and the LLM in taxation. Hunter Wayne Ragsdale, who will be receiving the JD, the MBA, and the LLM in taxation. Robert Michelle Weinecker IV, who will be receiving the JD, the MBA, and the LLM in business transactions. <laughs> Courtney R. Zotai, who will also be receiving the public interest certificate. William Powell Burgess III. Yeah. Marshall B. Trigg. John D. Hemmings III. <laughs> Benjamin Thomas Clark. Joseph T. Bear. John Walter Arnett.
Catherine Christine Craig. Walker N. Kowalczyk. <laughs> Amethyst A. Muncy. Bryce M. Dean. <laughs> Joshua N. Knowles. Kelsey Claire Yates, who will also be receiving the Public Interest Certificate. <laughs> Julie Nicole Jackson. Jordan Ryan Holman. <laughs> Shelby Alyssa Costoni, who will be receiving both the JD and the MSW. Juliana H. Kirby. <laughs> Darby Jalen Fowler, who will be receiving both the JD and the LLM in taxation. Gerald R. Ruddick. <laughs> Halisha White, who will be receiving the JM in taxation. Thomas W. Walters, who will be receiving the LLM in taxation. <laughs> Jeremy Blake Douglas, who will be receiving the LLM in taxation. Terika Nicole Farmer, who will be receiving the LLM in taxation. Aaron Blaylock, who will be receiving the LLM in taxation.
Please join me in recognizing and celebrating these 2023 graduates of the University of Alabama School of Law. I'm pleased now to invite and will be uh, delighted to welcome you to a reception which will be held next door at the law school on the Camille Wright Cook Plaza. Our commencement program now adjourns. Congratulations. <laughs>